Hey folks, Turbine Guy coming back at you. Now today's video is three federal appeals court judges listening to our case against the city of Orono. And over what you ask? This driveway behind me that my wife and I were criminally charged for installing. I did apply for the permit. City of Orono refused to issue the permit and instead criminally charged us to try to get us to comply with illegal requirements the city was trying to foist upon us. Well, I would have none of that. I defended myself in court pro se and not guilty was the verdict. And my wife herself, she was dismissed for lack of probable cause halfway through because she had nothing to do with it. And that's what the statute says. And that's what the judges talk about. The one thing I want you to look for in this is Jared Shepard, Orno attorney, devil incarnate in my opinion, tries arguing that once again, I'm the bad guy when he starts losing his case, as if it's all my fault, as if I have that kind of power over the city, as if I, the turbine guy, can make this city do my bidding. Well, hey, I'll tell you, enjoy it. I sure did. It was really fun watching these three real honest-to-goodness judges hold this city attorney accountable for his BS city's actions. That's our third case for argument. 21-2941, Minnesota, J. Nygaard et al. versus City of Orono. Mr. Cardall, when you are ready, you may proceed. May it uh, please the court, my name is Eric Cardall and I represent the appellants in the case. We seek reversal of the Rule 12 decision below. The standard review is de novo. And as the court knows, the factual allegations, the complaint need to be taken as true. We have two big issues with the district court opinion. Uh, we can start with page 18, where there's a discussion of a, our, our claim for declaratory judgment. That's prospective relief. Uh, there it says there's remedy in that there's no, uh, it's a case where there's a remedy in, cert, in search of a right that doesn't exist. But our view is under Morales and Papa Christu, the Nygaards have a right to be free, free of fear of criminal prosecution and jail under an unconstitutionally vague ordinance. So that's the due process clause. Now remember when the remedy is sought is a declaratory judgment act, and the court knows this, that the requirements are substantial controversy, parties with adverse interests, but most importantly here, immediacy and existence of a controversy to warrant declaratory judgment. Secondly, the alleged facts uh, that support the claims are, uh, weren't properly understood by the district court in the opinion. Critically, at page four, the court said the city did not approve the permit. Well, that suggests that there was a decision made, but in the complaint allegations 80 through 88, the paragraphs, if a decision had been made, then there would have been a civil appeal process and this would have been resolved civilly. Instead, there was a builder acknowledgement form put out by Director of Development uh, Jeremy Barnhart, and that had inapplicable conditions, which essentially denied my client a proper application process. Now, when you think about it, after the criminal trial, the city didn't require a permit. So let's think about that. So the judge wrote the city did not approve the permit after the criminal trial the city didn't require the permit. So I think we should just stick with taking the allegations the complaint is true. If that were true, if that's the case, then uh, then the rule 12 uh, requirements for the complaint have been met. So let's go through a little bit of the history. Uh, and so Mr. Nygaard read the ordinance 8666 not to require a permit. City Inspector Pizzo came out, did not stop the Nygaards with a stop work order but instead asked them to apply for an after the fact permit under 8636. Mr. Nygaard, in abundance of caution, followed the advice, applied for the permit. Then Director of Development Jeremy Barnhart, who knew the law, uh, put inapplicable conditions in a builder acknowledgement form. Our client objected to that. He uh, tried to get them to, to agree. Then after six weeks of disagreement, he wrote email to the prosecutor Please file a citation, that'd be against the Nygaards. Nygaard spent the last six weeks arguing with me. That's Appendix 75. So, so, you know, it's sort of like you put an inapplicable condition in and then you tell the prosecutor to prosecute. That's a type of coercion. The police officer relied on the Barnhart's report, didn't do a separate investigation, 
There's no evidence of him like reading the ordinance, no inspection of the property, the prosecutor the same. So is this little cycle of coercion for Nygaard's to comply with the inapplicable condition? And they didn't, they went to trial and they prevailed. And so the problem here is uh, first, that there, this is a prosecution without probable cause, which supports the First Amendment retaliation claim. It's malicious prosecution, it's abuse of process, but also it supports the vagueness claim, you see. That's really important. So remember declaratory judgment, it has to be imminent, and exist, and warrant declaratory judgment. So there's two purposes to go through the facts. The first is to show that the court got it wrong and the claims are supported sufficiently at this stage of the proceedings to go forward. But in the declaratory judgment, you're looking at the facts to see, oh, is this imminent? Have these city officials acted in such a way that the fear my clients have of this happening again is going to happen? Of course, I mean, we filed immediately. We want them to knock it off. They were manipulating these ordinances and going after my client. We fear that they'll do it again. And that's a point that the judge didn't address. Now, with respect to Kendall Nygaard, there was no notice of her of a possibility of prosecution. She lives in Florida. She wasn't aware of the driveway project specifically, not aware of the permit application. Counsel, she's, an, she's, she, she, she's an owner, though. My goodness, everything done, you, you, of course, Minnesota may be different, but, but often everything done is done against both owners, uh, husband and wife, many, many, uh, many, uh, many parts of law. Why is, why is this different? Well, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's different because of the, uh, the lack of notice in the statute again. Let's go back to 86.42. This is how, uh, when the, you know, the state legislature, when they draft the criminal code, you know, it's taken years, it's taken time to chisel those things out. Here, the city just adopted 8642, violations and penalties. A violation of the code is a misdemeanor. Well, that's not the type of effort required. How would Mrs. Uh, Nygaard know that this, this applied to her based on the language of 8666? She's supposed to discern that from 8642 and the rest? I, I think that it's different because of the way the language operates in 8666. It refers to the person who does the work. And, okay. and, and so... It looks like Judge Erickson has a question. I'll shut up. Go ahead, Judge Erickson. Well, all I was going to say is that well, when you look at the permits, they are always addressed to the property owners. And as long as you have an ownership interest in the in the property, if somebody asks for a permit and, you know, both parties are party to it in some ways, right? I mean, I'm I'm having a hard time with this idea that, that uh, you expect a uh, a municipality, many of whom are very small, that they're going to go through and make detailed findings on each and every uh, ordinance that they enact. I mean, having uh, represented it, a thousand, oh, a thousand, that's not true, dozens of communities that were, you know, 200 people, I think that, that you're laying out at some sort of a of a system that just doesn't exist in the real world any place. Now, I think that it's a different question as to whether or not uh, there was sufficient notice given in this case that there was any, uh, and that's been properly pled. Different deal entirely, but 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 the idea that somehow there's a there's a uh, some sort of impropriety in the in the enactment of the ordinance, I'm I'm having a hard time with that. Right. I know. I know. I get it. Uh, the the point is that uh, you know, like with respect to Republican Party of Minnesota v. White. Uh, the, the code of judicial conduct, I mean, we, it's a good effort, but Justice Kennedy said, you know, it takes a long time to get these things right. And so I'm not criticizing the criminal enforcement of some ordinances, but there's a provision here that says we criminally enforce all the ordinances, and that would require a check to see if in these ordinances that are criminally enforced, as in this case, whether the, when there isn't a mens rea requirement, no, no mental state requirement, has the act been specifically described in order to ensure that the person in that community you're talking about has notice of that conduct, which is declared criminal? And so when we see words like repair, okay, so I repair my house, I, uh, I improve my house, uh, okay, so you're going to criminally prosecute me without defining repair and improve? But uh, there, there's no definition. So, so what we want is well, fairness. Counsel, we, I appreciate. Uh, now, now I, I wasn't going to ask you this, but you brought it up. Don't we defer to the dictionary on all kinds of simple little words that are in statutes and even the U.S. Constitution? Tell me 
why we don't go to the dictionary. Right. Well, well, sure. That, that, that helps because a repair means repairing a light socket, repairing a carpet, repairing a, a, a out external wall. I mean, it's wonderful. Everything can be a repair if you're fixing something. Everything can be an improvement, putting in a garden, uh, putting in a, you know, painting, oh, painting the exterior. I would say that's improving, right? Well, counsel, so counsel now, now, now I must tell you that if you look at Black's Law Dictionary, Black's Law Dictionary says improvements, anything done to land. Ah, uh, but, the word, but the word is improve, not improvement. Well, so Black's okay. Law Dictionary probably doesn't have okay. an entry for improve. I, I get your point, you get mine. Now, a factual question I don't know. How long was it from when the judge found Nygaard not guilty until you sued? How I'll long was to, it? But let me check. Thank you for doing that. That's not in the district court's opinion and not in the stuff I have here. Okay. If it's, if it's easy, tell me. If it's hard, we'll figure it out. Okay. The uh, trial was in September 2020, and the complaint was filed March 30, 2021. Thank so you very it must much. Have been about six months. Thank you very much. Something good. like that. Uh, good so, enough. So, what, but one of the uh, so one of the issues uh, that I, I need to address in that line is that this idea that uh, we're going after the city. No, I, I didn't mean that, uh, Judge Erickson. What I'm saying is that when the city is drafting laws that are criminally enforceable, there's a greater requirement under the Constitution, particularly when there's not a mens rea requirement that the act be specifically described. And to go back to the earlier question, that when you have repair and improve, not, not improvement, in there, and it's so expansive, that it looks like Papa Christo and Morales. And that, that's the point of the vagueness claim, is that, you know, okay, so I'm repairing a light socket, you know, I'm painting the exterior of my house, and, and the city seems perfectly fine with that. And then with respect to the exi exigency and uh, imminent nature of this, is we have these city officials operating under this ordinance in the way they did. And so that means, okay, you know, uh, and I'm sure there's concerns with the court. Well, we don't want just bystanders on the street coming into our court and saying they want a declaratory judgment act on a land use control ordinance because it's criminally enforced. No, that's not, no. No, you guys, you, we're gonna narrow the door, right? We're gonna narrow the door that if you have this kind of situation where city officials are doing these sort of things under unconstitutionally vague ordinance, it creates standing for declaratory judgment action for just the criminal defendants in that proceeding. That is so precise. And I agree with Judge Erickson, we can't like take a 16 inch guns on the USS Iowa and start blasting away at, at the municipal governments and their codes, but we can protect the people in those cities from unconstitutional prosecutions, under unconstitutionally vague ordinances. And this is really what we're striving to do here. And it does take uh, you know, some attention to detail. Uh, it takes some uh, looking at the materials. And in the district court opinion, I, I, it was just that I think there was that misunderstanding regarding you know, if they had, Barnhart had made a decision, then my client would have had a civil appeal and things would have gone civilly. But instead, there was this email to the prosecutor, file a citation, and we went down this criminal road, which then creates the imminence, the existence, to justify the prospective remedy. With respect to the damage remedies associated with the other claims, you know, as I mentioned, I, I think we have enough facts alleged to support the elements of those that we get to discovery. I'll save the rest of my time for rebuttal. Very well. Mr. Shepard? Uh, may it please the court, Jared? No. Am I on now? Okay. Sure. May it please the court, uh, Jared Shepard of the law firm of Campbell Knudsen on behalf of uh, the city of Orno. Um, your honors, this case is quite simple. Um, it involves the city's enforcement of its zoning permit ordinance against appellants. And once we look at the facts as pled in the complaint and uh, the documents embraced by the complaint, um, we'll see there was probable cause uh, for the criminal prosecution here. We'll also see that um, the the ordinance is not unconstitutionally vague. So if I could uh, take you through some of those facts uh, and, and, and kind of point you in the right direction here. Uh, as we know, it, it, it's not in dispute. Um, Mr. Nygaard 
uh, removed and poured a new driveway without a zoning permit, which is required by city code uh, section 8666B. Hey, now, um, Council, let me ask you a question. Uh, you had a period of time from September 2020 when you lost the municipal case to March 2021. Most municipalities at some point give a permit of some kind, some way, somehow. And you never did, right? Well, Your Honor, it was effectively denied by, by the non-issuance um, that occurred in December, on December 12th, 2019. Um, remember, this is a permit. Okay, now wait, a, wait, you changed to a different September. So what do you say it was effectively denied? What, what, um, what are you talking about? Sure, so in, in, in um, what tells the what tells the homeowners it was effectively denied? Tell me. So on a, a, appendix page seventy four, there's a letter from uh, Community Development Director Jeremy Barnhart, dated December twelfth, twenty nineteen, and this is um, useful because it, it essentially tells the property owner here that look, all you have to do is acknowledge that we've made some comments on this builder acknowledgement form, and we will issue the permit. That's all you have to do, and we're going to give you one chance. To the end but of that's the day. neither the issuance nor the denial uh, of the of the uh, permit. And so, at the end of this letter, you say, "Well, you could do this. We'll do that." If nothing happens, the it's never denied. It's never it's never issued. I mean, it's is it is it still pending today? No, the the file is closed, Your Honor. All right. And so, uh, was any notice at any point? Was there ever anything ever sent? Uh, to to uh, uh, the NIGARD saying, yeah, we're not issuing the permit. We're, you know. Beyond this letter, uh, appendix page 74, which is also complaint exhibit eight, I don't believe there was any other um, letter sent. Uh, certainly there's nothing in the record before this court that another letter was sent. All right. Um, so so basically this, this permit request application continues to pen. No final well, action has ever been taken. Has ever been taken. No, no final action has ever been taken in, in terms of, uh, well, I, I would disagree with that. I think the um, the failure to issue was effectively a denial. Um, Do you have a case that have, says that, that just a failure to act is a denial? Well, we, Your Honor, I just want to kind of go back to the facts here, too. We have a, a driveway that's already been built. We're not talking about... Um, an application for something where the homeowner is waiting. Hey, I want to build this. Council, uh, council. Now, now, I may have a typical experience, but many, many contractors do something and then go get the permit. Uh, surely, surely that's true in uh, uh, your city. Uh, I, well, I think it happens, and I think 8636 um, certainly allows for that if a huh. homeowner is unaware that they were required a permit, which is uh, not the case here, of course, uh, but if the, the homeowner is unaware that a permit is needed, they have 30 days to get the permit. Um, those 30 days passed, um, more than 30 days passed, obviously. The city was trying to work uh, with the appellants and was unable to do so. And then at that point, he was already in violation of the code for building a driveway without a zoning permit. And so there was probable cause to issue, uh, to, to file the criminal complaint. And that probable cause was of course found uh, uh, reviewed by a district court judge and found to be adequate. But I, I do want to, to make a note really quickly, uh, Your Honors, with respect to the idea that there was no civil appeal right um, for the Nygaards. Um, as Mr. Uh, as the appellants note in their brief, there would be a potential uh, appeal to the Board of Adjustment of Appeals. And under city code, section 78-96, uh, it's, it's not in the record, but of course the court can take judicial notice of it. Um, the, any decision of a zoning enforcement officer, that means the decision to say, hey, you need a permit, that can be appealed to the Board of Adjustment and Appeals. So it's, it's not true that there was no uh, appeal right for Mr. Nygaard. He, he could have appealed any time he wanted to. He just chose not to. The was that a decision ever really made, though? I'm sorry, Your Honor. What? I mean, everything that that, that that went to the Nygaard seems to be conditional in some ways. I don't see anything that says we have decided. Period. I mean, and maybe uh, I, that it's just all, just all, just not 
not plainly stated, but I mean, you know, how do you appeal from something that says that doesn't say this is a decision of this person who's responsible for making this decision? Well, for, for one, Your Honor, it's very clear from the complaint <laughs> and the briefing that um, the appellants contend that they never were required to have a permit in the first place. So they certainly mm -hmm. could have appealed that decision. Then they could have appealed the decision when the city com came back with the builder's acknowledgement form and annotating the site plan and said, hey, these are things that you need to, to sign off on and we'll issue the permit. And that was made clear to the NIGARDS. They could have appealed that decision because, again, it falls under 7896, uh, which says you can appeal any decision of, of or order of uh, a zoning enforcement officer. So that was available to them. And I, I want to get to what I think counsel, is... Counsel, let me, let me, before we finish, now, Complaint Exhibit 8, which I've not read, but I see it referenced everywhere, it only says the possible legal action is threatened. It doesn't say anything about appeal rights, right? Or final decisions, right? Th that's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. Proceed. So I, I want to go back because I, I think this is important. There is there is context between these parties, um, and that context is revealed from the complaint, from the arguments of counsel, and from uh, civil cases that this court can take judicial notice of. Um, there are court cases listed on page 4, footnote 21 of the city's brief, and, and those are instructive. And, and he here's why. Once Nygaard was made aware by the city uh building official that he needed to have a zoning permit. He poured the driveway anyway, but he did go back in and apply for a permit after the fact. As we said, uh, the code contemplates for people who don't know that they have a permit, they have 30 days to once informed. Now he knew and poured anyway, but he applies for a permit. He submits a site plan. That, that site plan included more than the driveway. It included a wind turbine on the other side of his house on the Lakeward side of his house. Now that's important because of the ongoing litigation between uh, over several years, five or six now at this point, between um, the city and, and Mr. Nygaard, where he was told twice, um, not just Mr. Nygaard, sorry, the uh, both appellants, uh, twice that they could not have wind turbines on their property. And twice, two different district courts told them to remove those. Uh, one ended up in contempt where Mr. Nygaard was thrown in jail in order to get the final removal. And it, that's also important because the idea that this um, 8666B provides no notice about hardcover, Mr. Nygaard was very well aware of hardcover um, because that was litigated in those cases with respect to the footing for these wind turbines. And so he comes back, and I want to turn the court's attention to Complaint Exhibit 2. This is Appendix Page 67. He sends an email to Christine Matson, the uh, planner, and in relevant part, he said, the wind turbine is not a part of this application, but a separate one. Thus, I am not signing that part either, which the city would use to construe that I gave up my right to have a wind turbine. Last, I am not initialing the bastardized site plan I sent to you. Once again, the city would construe it as giving up my right to harvest the wind, and I will not do that. So essential... It, the wind turbine's inclusion on the site plan was essential to uh, the appellants. And then a follow-up to that makes it even more clear what he could have done. Appendix page 69, Complaint Exhibit 4, and an email back from the planner to Mr. Nygaard. If the wind turbine is not part of this application, why is it shown on the plan? Either accept the annotation offered by staff. This is the annotation where staff said wind turbine not permitted. Uh, or submit a new site plan removing objects not part of the permit application. And he rejected that. And he never submitted a new site plan. And as the record shows, all of the other, whether you call them conditions or comments, I think in hindsight, you could see that they all should have been under the comment section of that builder acknowledgement form. We find that everything was in advisory notation it wasn't something that he had to do because he had already built the, the driveway. And that was made clear again um, all the way in the December 12th letter from Mr. Barnhart. So the only thing that was ultimately the hang-up was this issue of the wind turbine. And you can compare the two site plans. Those are appendix pages 94 and 95 for the court. And so again, 
the problems here that were created were, were really problems created by the appellants. Um, there was probable cause uh, for that prosecution. Mr. Shepard, in that, in that regard, the, the citation um, charged them with a violation of Section 8666B, correct? That's correct. Is it an only 8666B? That's correct. All right. As I read 8666B, it says that a permit shall be submitted by the individual performing the work. Correct? That's correct, Your Honor. So what's the basis of probable cause against Kendall Nygaard for violating 8666B? Well, well Your Honor, as Judge Erickson noted um, and Judge Benton, um, this is very common that these uh, ordinance applied to the owner and occupants of the property. 8636. I see that yeah. in other ordinances of, you know, if, if we look at uh, 8636, it, it applies to owners. But this is 8666B, and it sure seems to me to say by the individual performing the work, not owners. So I don't, what's the base? In, in, was there any effort made to investigate whether Kendall Nygaard had an involvement in, in doing the work? Well, well two points, Your Honor. Um, first, uh, a lot of these ordinances operate together. I understand that the complaint only, it only talks about 8666B because that's the specific requirement per, for the permit. But a, a lot of city ordinances operate together. And when we talk yeah, but, about- but you can't have a bunch of city ordinances <laughs> operating together to, to form a criminal complaint. I mean, you know, a criminal complaint must allege a crime. A crime's got specific elements. And once you elect to uh, allege the, a criminal violation, uh, you've got to meet each of the elements. And it seems pretty clear that under 66B that there's just no way that that uh, that you can indict or, uh, or file a complaint against any criminal complaint against anyone except an individual performing the work? Well, um, your honors, I would submit that in, in this context, the individuals performing the work are the property owners. It wasn't that Mr. Nygaard himself is the one who, who, who came with a concrete truck and poured the driveway. I believe he had that um, uh, brought over by a contractor, but he had the work done and therefore Ms. Nygaard had the work done as a property owner. I do also want to note that on page 18 of the transcript of the hearing in front of the district court. Well, well um, wait a minute. Was there any investigation to determine whether she was there when the contractor came over with the concrete or any effort at all this to prove that or to investigate whether she had any involvement in in doing the work? Well, Your Honor, there, there's no nothing in the record that, uh, that discusses an investigation about whether or not uh, Ms. Nygaard had, was involved in doing the work. However, um, it, and at the district court oral argument, again, transcripts in the record before this court, page 18, um, uh, counsel for the appellants admit that they were in conversation about whether or not they should apply for a permit. Um, so there was, uh, you know, just as one could assume between two property owners, um, conversations about the work being done on the property that they own. Yeah, but I don't think we assume probable cause. And, and probable cause isn't shown after the fact. That's correct, Your Honor. Um, but again, I submit that that as a owner and occupant of the property, the city had probable cause um, to, to file a criminal complaint against um, Ms. Nygaard. And more importantly, um, the, sorry, Your Honor, if I may finish my comment, uh, more importantly, Judge Wall um, reviewed the complaint, found probable cause, and it's very clear from the case law that if a judge finds probable cause, it negates the lack of probable cause because um, the, 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 the person challenging it or the person who initiated the complaint is in, in no more better stead than the judge themselves. So I would submit that probable cause uh, existed here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Mr. Cardo, your rebuttal. You'll have to unmute your microphone. Yes, in the short time I have, I just wanted to emphasize one point. Um, you know, we're at the Rule 12 motion stage, 
And a lot of these legal issues are, are, are significant importance, of course, the NIGARDS and to the public. And so I, I, I would hope that we'd be allowed to have a discovery before some of the legal issues are resolved. For example, let me take one sentence from the district court opinion. The NIGARDS facial challenge is not brought on First Amendment grounds, making it generally disfavored under well-established law. Well, you know, sometimes you get new fact patterns like this one. You say, well, wait a minute, is fearing uh, prosecution in jail important too? Isn't due process important? And Papa Cristo and Morales uh, suggest that. Now, I agree the courthouse door has to be narrowed with respect to for the Declaratory Judgment Act relief remedy is to ensure that that person has been prosecuted under that ordinance that's being challenged as unconstitutionally vague. But that's the concern. I understand the court's concern. We're not going to open the door to everyone walking down the street to challenge ordinances that are criminally enforced. But if you have a situation like this, where these specific officials have used uh, that vague ordinance in this sort of a way, and, and uh, you know, and constitutionally acted, they have a reasonable fear of future criminal prosecution and being jailed. So why is the First Amendment right more important than the right not to be jailed, not to be prosecuted for the purpose of jailing? And so let me have, interrupt. Let me interrupt you. Do you know why I didn't see it in the opinion that the abuse of process claim, the declaratory judgment claim, were dismissed without prejudice? Do you know why I didn't see anything in the district court's order why that was done? Yeah, uh, yeah I, no, I, 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 I didn't either. I, I viewed it as sort of an exercise of a supplemental jurisdiction, and that was uh, a discretionary use there. But okay. I, I really feel that uh, the, the lower court thought there, that, that you know there's something wrong. We're going to let those claims uh, continue, and the lower court may have felt you know confined by these earlier decisions as well. But uh, I'm suggesting the court is just caution uh, that, that we, you know, these are really important legal issues. And, and what we should do is send it back down and then have us do the discovery and present it in a very good way. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, counsel. We appreciate uh, both counsel's appearance today and argument. Case is submitted and we will issue an opinion in due course.